This morning we come back to 1 Samuel. Um, we're in chapter 28, if you want to grab your Bible or the pew Bible next to you. Uh, we're kind of on our home stretch. If you remember where we left off, um, we had seen the situation that David was in. And uh, they were kind of building some tension. He was kind of in a, oh no, what am I going to do now moment. And then all out of nowhere, we, uh, we have sort of a this just in moment. Um, and uh, there's a much bigger problem brewing. And verse, or chapter 28 tells us about that. Uh, if you would, before we read, let's ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word. We understand from the record and history that this has uh, been preserved and protected for us down through the ages. And uh, we believe that what we have here uh, communicates accurately that which you gave to your prophets and apostles over the years. And we ask now, Father, that you would move in us by your Holy Spirit, that it he may enlighten and illuminate to us what we read. That you would open our hearts and our minds to understand what you're telling us, what you're showing us, what you're revealing to us of yourself, of who we are as descendants of Adam, as men and women, as human, as sinners as those who've been called to follow Christ, that you would reveal to us the glory of the Lord Jesus, something of the plan of redemption and of your walk with us, that we may leave here with a greater understanding, with a deeper faith, with humble hearts that respond to the conviction and challenge and encouragement of the scriptures, with greater love for one another, with greater conformity to the image of Christ and greater confidence in his finished work for our sake. Father, we now pray in the name of Jesus that you would work in us all these good things for your glory. Amen. First Samuel chapter 28, starting in verse 1. Or sorry, in verse 3. It's where we left off. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, <coughs> pardon me, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams, or by Urim, or by prophets. And Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And the servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put, out, put on other garments. And he went, he and two men with him. And when they came to the woman by night, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, Divine for me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel and he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. 
And Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I'm in great distress for the Philistines are warring against me and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophet or by dreams. Therefore, I've summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, why then do you ask me since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey his, the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell at once, full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and night. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly killed it. She took flour and kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread of it. And she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. What a scene. I just should probably say at the outset, if you can read that, if you can hear and picture this story and not be moved, I don't, I don't know if you got a heart in you. He has hit the bottom of his barrel. This is, aside from what's going to happen in the last chapter, this is the last desperate act. Saul has just completely fallen off the map. He has been deserted and destitute and is at an all-time low. As I read this, I sometimes I thought about one of the most frustrating things that I ever experienced about teaching in the 21st century. It wasn't that, that students knew so little. It's that there's, there's never been a time when there have been more access to answers, more access to information, good sources to find it, and, and yet they would fail or even refuse to make use of having so much more at their fingertips to find out what they needed to know. And instead, they would utilize resources that were lesser or more problematic or just wrong or just do nothing. And as I read this passage, I, I see a, an utterly destitute and desperate man. <laughs> and he is completely overwhelmed with being abandoned with facing an army that this is not a raiding party. This is not these little skirmishes. They have come for war and they have picked a place to do it where they could leverage the full weight of their chariots and everything that they had. They are out to destroy. And he's looking at them and he's completely overwhelmed. He's got nobody with him. He is alone for all intents and purposes and in desperation, he resorts to an absolutely unthinkable answer, and he descends into one of the last depths of despair. What Saul does is despicable, but when you think about where this man must be to do what he is doing, this is, I mean, it's an understatement to say he is not in a good place. And as we go through this and ask the Lord to reveal to us 
ways in which we may need to seek him about things and consider where we go for our answers and what it means that he's promised his presence for us and maybe to consider or maybe even to repent of or to think back and have sympathy for others as we remember times when we were not in a good place and we sought answers in all the wrong places and we resorted to things that we never should have resorted to so that we may hear ringing in our minds things like Genesis 6, 3 where God says, I will not always strive with man. There will come a day when I am done. Why the scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart because sometimes there comes a day where the lights go out and there is no opportunity left. There will come a day when for the last time you will have your last sensitive moment. And the scripture pleads, turn to God today, repent today, seek him in all the ways in which he may be found today. Do not harden your hearts. Saul has refused and refused and refused. And now the voices are gone. Now the light is out. There is no way out. There is no one to help. There is nothing. And like David said earlier, now I think Saul will probably say, I am but a step away from death. That is where this man is. This is what, this is the picture of refusal to repent, to obey, to submit. This is a refusal to let God be God and us play our part to do his work for his glory. This is a picture of how bad it can get without Christ. First of all, you can see there in the first three verses, that deserted by God, Saul has no faith. This is not the, this is not the first time the people of God were up against you know, a, a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. This has happened before. But this time, Saul is looking at it and he's completely overwhelmed. He's completely overwhelmed. He's desperate. He has no faith. There's this great dilemma you've got. You've got not only Samuel is gone, which we're reminded of that, and we're going to see here in a, in a, in a we see later why it's important that, that the writer here mentions that Saul had put these mediums and necromancers out of the land. And then he's got this great war, this great army that's assembled and and he's looking at them. And again, this is not a raiding party. This, this is all out army. And having no presence of God's spirit, no voice of God, no prophet, no favor from God, nothing's going his way. The only thing that Saul can see is himself and what he hopes to accomplish and what he has to bring to the table. And his faith is replaced by fear. And his heart is is trembling greatly within him. Sometimes we decide to build our own kingdom, to operate by our own wisdom rather than God's. And when we do that, the obstacles that we then face seem completely overwhelming. And on our own, they are. When we're trying to build our own castle, sometimes we don't see how we can overcome the obstacles that are there. But the, the point is that nothing is impossible with God. Only God can provide an escape. And without him, there is no way out. God could have handled this. He's handled more. He's handled bigger, bigger problems than this. Nothing's impossible with him. But that's not true for us by ourselves. And so Saul said, this isn't this is impossible. There's no way out. And so then in 6... Not only has he been deserted by God and he has no faith, but he's been deserted by God and now he's got no light. He's got no truth. And it says that he inquired of the Lord and God didn't answer him. By dreams, by prophet, Samuel's gone and, and David's got Gad, but 
Saul's got no one, and, and by Urim. Now, that was something that the priests handled. The priests handled that Urim business. You can go back and do your homework. Well, why, why, why wasn't that there? And Saul, maybe he thinks, oh, yeah, because I butchered them all at Nob. I killed a lot of them. So there's nobody left. Everybody that should be there is not there. And now, I don't know if you have you spent any time reading the Chronicles. The Chronicles are sort of like a recounting of a lot of this after they come back from exile. And so you, in, in First and Second Chronicles, you have sort of a retelling of a lot of what happens. And in First Chronicles 10, you can look it up later if you need to. You don't need to turn there now unless you want to, which you can. It mentions uh, in 1013, so Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. Verse 14 says, He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Well, this says he, he didn't seek guidance from the Lord. And first Samuel says he did seek guidance from the Lord. Well, I don't think that's a contradiction. He didn't. Right? You, you can go looking for the truth. Like, I can ask you without actually asking you. I'm not, I'm not interested in what the answer you have is. I may be orthodox. I may go through the perfunctory, you know, role of like, this is what I'm supposed to do because I'm a good boy, but I don't genuinely want your answer. I'm not actually looking for help from you. Somebody tells me I'm supposed to do this. I, I prayed about it. Did you, did you pray? Or did, you, did you bow your head and you muttered some words? Or do you weren't really interested in what God had to say? See, this is a difference. I don't think this is a contradiction at all. He didn't look to God for answers. He hadn't been looking to God for answers for years. That's why he's in the spot that he's in. He said he did. He went through the motions. His heart was nowhere near where it needed to be. And this section here from 6 to 15 is probably the core of this whole story. I, I, don't, I think it's safe to say he didn't actually look to God for answers. When looking for the Lord's sake, not for the Lord's wisdom, he, he just wanted some confirmation. He wanted somebody to just tell him, what to do that seemed right to him. I certainly bet he's, he's regretting slaughtering all those priests now because there's no one left to even roll the dice or read the bones, so to speak. But when that doesn't work, look how quickly he goes to something that is expressly forbidden. You go back and read you know, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, like this is, this is a no-no. You don't, you don't do this. And instead, he, he put these people, these mediums, these necromancers, these witches for all intents and purposes, out. He kicked them out of the land. And he immediately turns to going to them for answers. And isn't it odd, right? These men that are with him, they know exactly where to find this woman. Oh, yeah, she's here. <laughs> Long-term consequences of when they went into that land and God said, you eliminate every other single group of these people. I don't want you mixing with them because you will take in this junk, this idolatry, this wickedness, right? This is part of my judgment on them. Get rid of every one of them and everything of theirs. Do not incorporate this. And they failed to do it. And this wicked idolatry just rooted itself in that land and they couldn't hardly get it out. Yeah, they kicked them out of the land, but these men knew like that where to find this woman. They kept sin at arm's length. They should have just completely chucked it over the edge. Sometimes we keep things close and we say, I'm not going to have any more of that. But it's close enough. I don't got to go that far to get it. And it remains a temptation. It remains there. You see it and you think about it. That's why Paul tells Timothy when it, when it comes to like sexual sin, flee immorality. Do not, trade, do not stay. Don't try to fight it. Don't try to stand there and look at it and go, no, I'm not going to go there. Get away from it. Run away from it. Get as far as you can because you're not going to win this if you, go, if you try to go toe to toe on your own with sin. You're not going to win. Get away from it. Put it away from you. Well, they didn't. It was so a part of that land that it was easy to find this woman then. Easier to find her than it was to find the Lord for Saul. 
like I said, we need to seek the Lord while he may be found because he's not always going to strive with men. Isn't it interesting then? I'm thinking of, of, of Hebrews. So as we try to, where do we put all this now in New Testament times? The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1, 1, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he created the world. 2 Timothy 3 reminds us that it is this word that has been breathed out by God that he's given to us that's sufficient for equipping the saints for everything they need to do. You can find God. You can find him right here with the Holy Spirit that has been given to us to make us to make sense of this for us, to teach us, to grow us, to walk along with us. You need to look for signs and wonders and and every quiver in my liver and I feel this way and that way. God has spoken to us through his son. It's interesting as you look at like 8 through 14, the role that the clothes play. The clothes make the man. We've seen over the chapters how Saul has been in these instances where the robe is taken from him or torn from him. Or he grasps for Samuel and he tears his robe and, and Samuel says that this day the kingdom has been torn from you. And Jonathan takes off his robe and gives it to David. These symbols, if you go back earlier in Samuel, we didn't start that early, but, but how Samuel's mother, when he was in the temple, used to make a robe for him every year and bring it to him. And what does Saul do? Saul finally just gives in to the whole thing. It's like that moment, you know, in, uh, in, in, in Star Wars when Anakin finally just gives in to the dark side and you see him, you know, got that black and he just puts the hood up. He just gives in. He's just going to go. He's just going to accept it. He's just going to accept going over to the dark side. And so here you've got Saul and he disguises himself. He just, I'm done with this kingly robe. It's been ripped out of my hands. I can't handle it. It's not working. I'm just, I'm just going to give in. And he puts this disguise on. And then when Samuel comes and Saul says what do you see and she says I see an old man in a robe and he knows exactly who that is and he falls on the ground how significant I had a discussion once and, and people didn't like to hear it but they were discussing this, this scene in like Revelations 19 and 22 when you have the saints and, and how do you see when you look at them what do you see you see them clothed in white robes. Well, this is about what we're going to be wearing in heaven. I said, I think there may be a bigger point, just slightly, that this is representative of the robe of righteousness that, that God puts on those who are in Christ by faith. It's Christ's robe. It's his robe. It's perfectly white. It's been washed clean. And we are given that to wear, to tell us who we are and what he's done. The clothes make the man. And it's significant that we have been given these robes of righteousness that are not ours. It is Christ's. And Saul is in a disguise. And Samuel's got this robe, and she knows who it is. Goes at night, he goes in disguise, goes in the dark, nothing good happens then. It's interesting, too, in verse 10, right? Here you have this woman who says, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. And Saul says, listen, it's going to be all right. Nothing bad's going to happen. Who does that sound like? Here's a woman. We shouldn't be doing this. King says we shouldn't do this. And here's somebody tempting us. Oh, it's going to be fine. It's going to be okay. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if he had a lisp or a forked tongue when he said it. <laughs> the witch actually comes out looking all right in this story because she's like, you know, I don't, I don't think we should be doing this. This isn't a good idea. But it's Saul. It's the one who was put in charge, who was supposed to be doing the right thing. <laughs> one commentator wrote, like, this is, this is the equivalent of a, of a woman with her lover, who's not her husband, swearing on the life of her own husband. Asking for herself for things that she would not permit for others. I swear by the Lord, you're with a witch, Saul. You were told not to do this. You know you shouldn't be here. She knows you shouldn't be here. And you're swearing on the Lord's name that everything's going to go fine? He is out of his mind. 
He's out of his mind. This doesn't happen in a blink. This has been a long spiral downwards of rejecting the Lord's voice, of rejecting the Lord's voice, and simply not submitting, not repenting, not giving in, not being humble. Do we find ways to ignore or hide or deny our own sin behind our orthodoxy, behind our external, uh, you know, we perform the functions, we assent to truth, but we do it without conviction and without commitment. I believe things should go this way, but then I don't do them. I think this is right, but I'm okay with myself doing otherwise. This woman's terrified, and I think it, there's a temptation to get hung up here and go, what does this tell us about the reality of necromancy? That is not the point of this. Don't get hung up on that. That is not the point. Don't, don't let that take you away from what is clearly being told to us in this section. From this woman's reaction, when she sees Samuel and she screams, I get the sense that she's, she's kind of a charlatan. But this time, she knew. This is legit. This, 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 is, this is real. I tell people I see things, but like, this happened. I, I'm inclined to think this is, this is Samuel. And God has sovereignly sent, in the same way that he sent Moses and Elijah, they had died. But he sent them back to Jesus. Right? Remember on the mountain of transfiguration and, and, and Peter, James, and Paul, or Peter, not Paul, uh, Peter, James, and John, they see Moses and Elijah. They, they were dead, but they see these men. Right? I'm inclined to think that's what happened here. That God sent Samuel back. She's terrified. She knows now what's going on. Verse 15. That's kind of the middle. Saul is completely and utterly undone. Do you hear what he says? This, this is the most heartbreaking verse in the whole thing. And Samuel's like, why, why are you here? And he said, I'm in great distress. That's probably an understatement. The Philistines are warring against me. God's not talking to me. He doesn't answer me. There are no prophets. There are no dreams. I'm not going to mention the priests because I don't want you to know what I did to them. I'm kind of ashamed of that. I'm kind of wishing I hadn't done that now. And I'm... I'm telling you to show up and tell me what to do. The audacity of this man. I mean, this is just, this is a pathetic picture. He's at his wit's end. He's looking for a voice from God in the devil's den. <laughs> Alistair Begg said once, it's like Saul is saying, well, heaven wouldn't answer, so I'll just try hell. There is no worse state to be in as the state of being abandoned by God, separated by sin, separated by impenitence. That is why, again, the scripture repeats Psalm 95. That's quoted in Hebrews 3. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So the lady's freaking out. Saul's now completely overwhelmed. He falls on his face. Samuel tells him exactly what's going on. Says that he's an enemy of the Lord. That seems, that seems pretty stout, Samuel. I mean, yikes. Guy came to you for help. And the best, best you got to tell him is, God's your enemy now. You're God's enemy. Makes me think of Ephesians 2. The beginning when it talks about us as being sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and mind we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind or maybe even more succinctly Romans chapter 5 some of you already know you hear the word enemy and you know but what's what's Roman, Romans 5 8 through 10 it says but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for us since therefore now we have been justified by his blood much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God 
saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we will, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Man, enemy of God. Yeah, and such were some of us. Such were all of us, enemies of God. And we're going to see what happens to those who remain enemies of God. That's why it's so important. I never want to miss the chance to have the passing of the peace at the beginning of our worship. Because that is what reassures us. If you come in the name of Christ, you are not coming as an enemy any longer. It's one thing to be the enemy of God, but to put that in perspective, you consider who God is. To think of God as your adversary and not as your ally, not as your savior, not as your redeemer. That is utterly hopeless. Not only is he without faith and he is without light and truth, deserted by God, Saul is without hope. You can see that 16 through 25 there. Now we're told, right? Remember back in, in 15 when Samuel says, the king's been taken from you and given to a neighbor who's better than you. Now he confirms that that is David. I think Saul already knew. But he says right here, he's given it to your neighbor, David. You didn't do what he told you to do. It was his wrath he wanted you to take out on these people, not yours, not for you to save this guy and keep all the good stuff and burn all the bad stuff. It was God's wrath on enemies of God. You were supposed to take them out and you didn't. And for all these reasons, now God is your enemy. And not only are you going to pay for it, when he, when he says there, right, I'm going to give you into the hands of the Philistines and all of Israel, you and your sons are going to be with me. AKA, you're going to die. You're done. You're done. You will die in this battle. You and your sons. Furthermore, that army that you are supposed to lead, of God's people, they're going to be taken to. It's not, it's not good news. And look at verse 20. What is there left to do? This man who we're told was head and shoulders above everybody else. He's the biggest, best looking guy on the block. And where is he now? He is flat on the ground with no hope, no answer, no way out, there is no one listening. There is no escape. He is done. He is desperate. He was in disguise. He is destitute and deserted, and he is done. He is completely unraveled. We would like to point the finger at Saul. My heart breaks for him, and it grieves for me because I know what I am capable of and that I am capable of this same thing. That is what sin in any human being will do if we refuse to repent, if we refuse to listen, if we refuse to get off our throne and recognize it is God's throne over all things. And he would not. He simply would not. And this is what happens to the enemies of God. It is a death sentence. And there is only one more shoe to drop, one more final act of faithless despair and desperation and disobedience, and that comes in the last chapter. So where do we go with that? <laughs> not a real pick-me-up sermon this morning, Pastor. No, it's, it's not. But in a way... Ephesians 2 says, remember in verse 12 that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's not a real pretty picture either. And he's speaking to us. But now, he says, in Christ, you are who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. How? Because it was this man, Jesus, who on the cross, both Matthew and Mark only record one of the sayings of Christ on the cross, and it's the same one. 
where Christ on the cross quotes the 22nd Psalm and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is where Saul is at. No one's answering. I need you to tell me what to do. We would be in that same spot except for this Christ who got on that cross for his people and he endured that. Aside from all the physical torture and pain and agony that Christ suffered by being executed on a cross, the most painful part of Christ's work was that moment when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because never in eternity had he ever experienced that. But he experienced that for you and for me if you are one of Christ's children so that we would never, ever have to say that again. Never, ever experience that. The writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse uh, 16, he writes... Having said that we have a high priest who, who's not unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but who uh, in every respect has been tempted as we are yet was without sin, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And later in that same book, in the last chapter, chapter 5, we are reminded, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said I will never leave you nor forsake you I will never leave you nor forsake you sometimes our problem is with God we got problems we go to God with our problems about things going on out here things that we're unhappy with things that aren't going well things that we don't know what to do but sometimes our problem is with God we've not dealt with God honestly We've not gone to God or we're upset with God. But how many times in the Psalms did you hear David wrestle? God, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're doing. I feel alone. I feel abandoned. And what did he do? Where did David go when David had a problem with God? He went to God with that problem. No matter what the problem is, we go to God, not from God. Because there comes a day when God says, I am not striving with you anymore. So today, when you hear that voice, listen, respond. Today, don't harden your heart. Because when you end up where Saul is and you are begging for an answer that you'll do the opposite of what you should do, thinking God's somehow going to be there, sometimes what we get that and when you if you skip ahead to the end you see where that eventually takes this man and how many people do we know who have been at that same end who've gotten to that same place there is no answer there is no way out and finally they resolve there is only one answer left and I must do this It's not a good place to be. So with love, compassion in our hearts, having seen what can happen and what ends up happening with those who are enemies of God, let's plead earnestly, first with ourselves. Be honest with ourselves. And look at ourselves, not in light of David, but in light of Saul. Thank God, if we are one of his children, that Christ has taken all of that for us. And that when we're in that difficult spot, even if it's when we are wrestling with God, that we are to go to God first, not last. And to seek him while he may be found.